Hi. Uh, my name is Amelia Abreu, and I am a PDX-based design researcher uh, and the founder of UX Night School. Thank you all so much for coming, and thank you, Scott, and the rest of the team for organizing such a cool community event. So today, I'm going to talk about developer experience. You know, we say in computing, the hardest problem is naming. And it's really hard to come up with names for the things that we consider, the things that we consider important, and things that can translate back and forth be between disciplinary boundaries. But over the past few years, I have worked a lot on tools built by developers in order to make them usable by other developers. And uh, there's a growing movement in making developer tools more useful. And I think this is especially important in we, if we talk about communities like this, when we have folks coming from various disciplinary backgrounds, various technical backgrounds, and how can we make the things that allow us to do, uh, you know, to do the science, to do the, the work that we do, accessible to more folks both inside and outside of our communities. So today I'm going to talk to you about who I am and why I'm talking to you about this. I'll give a brief overview of user experience because it is a very vague term. Uh, and talk about my own experiences with the first generation of R, which was you know, basically the ice age. Uh, and uh, give you a case study of uh, an R-powered tool that I worked on and how we improved usability and redesigned it to make more sense in terms of folks' workflow. And then I'll talk about where we go next. Is that? Oh, yeah. So who am I? I'm not Homer Simpson. Spoiler alert. Uh, I, like I said, I live here in Portland, and I'm a design researcher, and I work a lot on developer tools and services for developers. Um, I've also worked a lot with academic medicine and tools for academic medicine. Um, and, but before this, I was a PhD student and dropped out. Uh, And I am, I am primarily a qualitative researcher, but I'm one of those annoying qualitative researchers who knocks on your door and says, hey, I want to know, know how often people change their passwords in this application. Or, hey, I need some demographics. Um, and uh, I've, always been, you know, I've always been interested in playing with stats. Um, and last year, uh, in addition to doing consulting work, I started teaching again outside of the university, which was, has been really fun. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about design research and user experience, uh, we're going to be doing some new workshops, and you can join us. All right. So the term user experience is actually one that I don't really like. So I'm very happy that we're saying developer experience now, because user is a very demeaning word. Who would you describe as a user? No one you actually liked. Uh, it assumes that the folks who use your tool are not contributing anything. Sarah Sharp, who uh, is a local open source advocate, told me that she likes to use the term com uh, contributor in place of user, which just has such different semantic overtones. Uh, and the thing is, is that what we do call user experience today draws on a very long line of study of making things usable for humans. Folks will ask me, well, where does user experience come from? It seems kind of made up. And I'm like, well, the ancient Greeks adapted tools to make them more usable. And in the, you know, if we skip forward a few years, and, uh, you know, the Industrial Revolution brought forth a real use case and return on investment factor for making machines usable by workers. And a lot of the research that I came across in grad school that I found to be really poignant was not about what we would consider to be terminal computers. It was about uh, what I would call Homer Simpson jobs. Uh, nuclear power plant operators, airline pilots. How do we make things simple so that folks can use the tools available to them with minimal cognitive overload? And 
And I like to say that I approach my work um, with this theorem, this Homer J. Simpson theorem, is that we are all a little bit overwhelmed. We've all gotten too little sleep the night before. We're all eating junk food all the time. We all would rather be at the bar with our friends. And when we are working, and I would consider academic research to be work, uh, we don't want to, we're, we're trying to do the best we can. Because we talk a lot about 10x engineers and being super productive. And I've certainly worked on a lot of tools that are designed to boost productivity. But we don't build tools that are usable for broad ranges of people when we design for a use case of someone who's perfect. Because approximately 0% of us are perfect. And this is another assumption that I feel gets floated around a lot, is that user experience equals GUI, or GUI, or I feel very old just using that term. Um, and this was the first thing that I ever heard about R when I was in grad school last, in the last decade. That was like, oh, well, there's no UI. You just have, it's a command line application, which in itself, things have changed. And uh, I was playing with our studio the other day and I was amazed at how easy it was to use. But this is part of the user experience. And it's definitely one that will shut out folks who do not have a grasp on the workflow or don't have the support within their communities to get things like this up and running. And I, I mention this because there's something deeper here, especially about that ergonomic dimension. Oftentimes when I work with folks on developer tools, a real item of contention is keyboard shortcuts. Who's an Emacs user here? Yeah, y'all use different keyboard shortcuts <laughs> than a lot of other applications. And uh, often, and if, you're, and if an Emacs user is going to design a tool based for their own workflow, it's going to require some adaptation from a Vim user or someone who's not familiar with either of those keyboard shortcuts. And the interesting thing about keyboard sh shortcuts is that they are also a very important factor for accessibility. So to move on with this uh, progression through user experience, this is uh, another framework I like to draw on, which is Jesse James Garrett's Elements of User Experience from the year 2000, like pre-Ice Age. Um, but I'm sure statisticians would agree with me. Things that stick around, stick around because they're good, because they're classic. And um, I really like how this is, this is laid out because it puts this, uh, puts this middle realm of information design and information architecture um, in relation to these sort of baseline requirements of a, and functions of an application. And I think that this also shows in a very graphical metaphor. Uh, I, loved your meta I loved your graphical metaphors from the last talk. Um, how user experience is impacted at every part of the development process, or as one says, at every level of the stack. But you ask me, like, I, I'm not, you know, you say, oh, that's very interesting, but what actually makes for a good user experience? What makes a site usable? And one of the frameworks that I really like to use is uh, Jacob Nielsen's 10-point usability audit which is also from uh, the ancient age of 1995, uh, which is a 10-point audit that you can conduct on any tool or system to gauge usability. And this is, some, this is a good place to start. You can test, you can iterate on what you find through here, but these 10 points are often, you know, are the, are the major areas where if you're, if you're lacking, you will encounter user difficulty. So, moving forward, I'm going to talk about this in application. I want to sit, start this by, I've been thinking about, you know, about what stats packages have done for um, the process of finding information, of disseminating knowledge, um, and just in terms of workflows. I, my father, 
used to tell me when I was growing up that when he was in college and high school, they would, uh, you know, they would set, they would, his, part of his, you know, amateur computer club would be to call in, ma call in problems to a mainframe downtown and then uh, wait for the answers and get some cards in the mail. And I also think about my mother was a mainframe operator and you know, likes to tell me stories about all the times when she worked at the Federal Reserve Bank and the mainframes were down. And that was when like, everybody hung out, people got a chance to know each other. And in academic research, there are a lot of cycles of review, revise, resubmit, and there's a lot of built-in contemplation there, a lot of built-in analysis, time for analysis, and uh, figuring out what the, what, val what the most valuable insights from any research project are. But thanks to the new generation of tools, we're able to have insights at our fingertips all the time. And this is how we sell developer tools as insights at our fingertips all the time. More data, more insights. But as after my parents, you know, monkeyed around with computers in the 70s, they became teachers in the 80s. When I was, and when I would ask for help with my math homework, we had a chalkboard in our dining room and they would say, um, okay, they would, uh, they would make me do my math problems on the chalkboard, which I found to be very painful. So I was working with a performance analytics startup, and they had this problem of constantly finding new insights and constantly shipping them to the dashboard so that their consumer, that their customers were often, often lost in, uh, you know, when it was that what it was that they were seeing and how it made sense and because this was a management tool these are also sensitive data this these, you know these are this is employee performance data so what did we do i uh i took as my inspiration uh r.i.p dj screw the this familiar figure in texas rap music who uh, uh chopped and screwed hip-hop hits and we we made paper prototypes of the existing dashboard. And what this did is that it took a lot of the ego and it took a lot of the preciousness and perfection out of the dashboard. And it also allowed us to work through with our own hands what sort of workflows we were designing for. What we did, and then we did five usability tests, just five, uh, and uh, as, uh, and as uh, one of the most cited meta studies in user experience says, five usability tests will encounter 80% of usability issues. This allowed us to redesign the dashboard, not with anything new or fancy, but with elements of, you know, elements of analysis displayed in ways that made the most sense to the end users of the tool. So where do we go from here? And I know I'm over time. I, uh, it's, it's that talking about my mainframe computing always gets me distracted. But where do we go from here? We, you've heard this. What, what do I take away from this? What I've been thinking about lately is that, you know, we talk about products. We talk about, oh, we have a new framework. We have a new tool. We have a new, a new environment. Uh, but we talk about them as just end products, as something that has nothing to do with any human, human effort or human work. And I want us to think more about services um, and how we can create services in conjunction with our users, or the developers who will use our tools down the line, and how those folks are different than us. So thank you. Sorry for going over. Uh, let's work together. If you're in Portland, please, you know, Join, look, check out UX Night School, and uh, thanks again.